best years of your life. You've never had uh, you've never had the preparation as as thorough as the I've never had personally. I've never had the preparation for the financial year that is as thorough as the one we have had in this time. And uh, we believe that you know God has brought this for us uh, for a great purpose. I believe that out of us, God is raising millionaires. Out of us, God is raising billionaires who will be kingdom financiers, who will be kingdom builders, kingdom supporters in the mighty name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus. The blessing of God makes a man rich. And I believe that we are tapping into that blessing as we as we pursue kingdom economy. Kingdom economy. And you know my practice, you know my habit. It's a good habit, I think. I want to to do a small a small um, a small survey of what we have learned this day since morning just type in the chat the one thing that has stood out for you because you know we might be having new people who have just joined and uh, and we want to bring them to speed concerning what we've been covering, want them to um, kind of catch up. Uh, those who have missed uh, previous sessions, uh, when the seminar is done, you can visit our YouTube channel and, um, and listen. We shall upload the ones we have recorded. There are also those ones of previous seminars. Take time to listen. Uh, I am who I am because I have listened to messages, to messages from different men of God, uh, different women of God over the years. They have made me who I am. I learned something some years ago that as I listen to the word from a man of God or as I watch him speak, I can catch the anointing that is on him. <laughs> yeah, I can catch an anointing as I listen to the word of God. And it has happened to me so many times. I, because of that, I have so many anointings within me because I have listened. There is some kind of anointing from T.D. Jakes, anointing from Miles Monroe, anointing from Bill Johnson, from Randy Clark, from Doug Howard Mills, from... Joyce Mayer, from Creflo Dollar, from uh, John Hagee, from all these men and women of God that have listened to over the years. And uh, it's a secret. The more you listen to the word of God, the more you have fellowship with the one they had fellowship with. Yes. So let us, um, you know, share what we've learned and, uh, since morning. To escalate your blessing, you must escalate your giving. That was such a powerful revelation. It was such a powerful revelation. We must escalate our giving. You know. Hallelujah. When grace works in us, it stirs in us the desire to give. Yeah. Grace. Ah. For a long time, we used to know grace as unmerited favor. And that's what it is. But that's not the full package. In fact, tonight I'm going to show you another definition of grace. But grace, there is grace for us, you know, grace with Jesus, which God had for us. Then there is grace in us. Then there is grace on us, you know. Grace is that divine power that works in us to do and be everything God wanted us to be, okay? Giving according to your ability, that was a great lesson. Uh -huh. Any other, any other, any other lessons, any other lessons? We must yield to God first. If you want to be great givers, give ourselves the minister we trust and be directed by them. Yes, same lesson that Kaka Mary had. 
we must give ourselves to God. You surrender. One of the best prayers you can pray is, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I surrender. You know, and you mean it. Then when you do that, the thing, there's no end to what God can do in you and with you. Hallelujah. Uh, any other? Any other? Any other? I, I keep asking this because I don't want to just, you know, attend the seminar and that's it. And we just say, uh, I attended the seminar. It was powerful. Oh, you know, Rona learned about being a balanced giver. That was powerful, being a balanced giver. You know, I want to ask a question. Remember in the morning, I talked about giving as a grace. Mm -hmm. That was a powerful lesson, Carol. We must come to a point where I disregard our needs and give to the work of God. You know, you put them on hold. You you you, you postpone some things and or you 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 with we uh, you you um you forfeit some things and then you give uh, for the work of God. Great givers have given themselves to God first. I talked about um, giving as a grace, okay? Uh, giving as a grace. Um, you know, I talked about, then at lunch time, I talked about the Macedonian grace. Um, now, I want to ask a question. If somebody asked you, and I want somebody to put an answer for me in the chat. If somebody asked you, what is grace? If suddenly you are in a conversation with a Muslim or with a, uh, a Catholic or what, or a Seventh-day Adventist, or you know, somebody who doesn't go deep into these spiritual things, and um, they ask you that, I hear you people, you keep talking about grace, 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 grace. What is it? How would you answer that person in a few words, without a story? How would you describe the grace of God? What would be your answer? Let me see about five people. Give me some answers. You can type in the chat, you know, and type in the chat and say, for me, grace means this. For me, grace means this. For me, grace means this. You know? The ability to do something that I would not have done willingly or on my own. Powerful. Thank you, Maureen. The ability to do something that I would not have done willingly or on my own. Comfort says unlimited favor. Uh -huh. Rachel says receiving something that you don't deserve. All these are powerful descriptions and they are all rooted in the scriptures. Any other definitions? Of grace, hmm? the form of divine. Susan says the form of divine favor, love, clemency, and a share. Wow, in the divine life of God, a share in the divine life of God. You know, grace. What is grace? What is grace? How how would you describe grace? Sufficient favor of God. Sylvia says, you know what else? What else? Doing something that wouldn't have done as a person. Okay? Yes, that's that's it. You know, there's a time Paul said that I worked harder than all the apostles, yet it was not me but the grace of God that worked in me. So doing something that wouldn't have done as a person. Anything more? Any other person? Two, three more people want to share something? What, how do you understand grace, kindness, uh, that one you're talking more of mercy, really. Mercy is is what is related to kindness, and um, um, anything more, anything else, anything else. I want to show you a scripture that will summarize kind of uh, what we covered uh, in the morning and lunch time, and also take us to what we are going to share this evening. 
uh, getting something good when actually I was supposed to get the bad one, unmerited favor, unmerited favor, yes. I want us to open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. All the definitions you have given are great definitions. Now I want to show you another definition. Grace is like, uh, what would you say, a diamond. It has different sides. It has, you know, when you think you know it, then there is another side. It has different sides. Dif Grace has different sides to it. And every single day, I keep understanding more sides to this thing called grace. Now, Paul writes the Corinthians and says, uh, you, uh, for you know, ah, this is a, it's long. Uh, NIV, give it me in NIV or NLT. But anyway, let me read it in the Amplified. For you are becoming progressively acquainted with and recognizing more strongly and clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus, okay? In brackets, his kindness, his gracious generosity, his undivine favor, undeserved favor, and spiritual blessing, okay? So his grace is his kindness, his gracious generosity, his undeserved favor, and spiritual blessing. In that, so now the next part of the verse shows how this grace of the Lord Jesus was expressed, okay? In that, though he was so very rich, yet for your sakes, he became so very poor, in order that by his poverty, you might become enriched. <laughs> that is how the grace of the Lord was expressed, that he was so very rich, okay? He was so... The, the, another version says, I think there's a brief version, uh, NIV, I think, says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty, you through his poverty, might become rich. That also is grace. Okay, the grace of God is such that he was so rich, yet he became poor, so that through his poverty, you might become rich. So you can see from this scripture that it is God's will, really, for you to be rich. Jesus became poor so that you can be rich. Yes. Do you get that? Do you get that? Are we together so far? He became poor so that you can become rich. So every other single time, one of the you, your expectation as a child of God should be to step into that which Jesus became poor so that you could become. Uh, it is God's portion, God's purpose, God's plan. You remember Jeremiah 29 verse 11, I alone know the plans I have for you, says God. Plans to prosper you, not to bring you disaster. Plans to give you a future and a hope. The plan of God is to prosper you. Is to prosper you. It is within the divine providence and the divine purpose and the divine will of God for you to be prosperous. So understand it, think about it, renew your mind to it, love it, embrace it, say it, speak it, declare it every day, every single moment. Say, God, Jesus was very rich, but he was made poor so that through his poverty, I might become rich. Which means there is a grace that he bestows upon his children. To become rich. He gives us power to make wealth. And in this kingdom of economy, we need to look upon Jesus and his principles and how he talks about these things and get the keys he's talking about and start using these keys. Okay. The scripture says, I mentioned it yesterday, um, and the other day, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, uh, But seek and aim at and strive after, first of all, 
his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added to you. Praise the Lord. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is a key right there. Do you see that? It's a key. It's a powerful key right there. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So we see from this that, you know, the Gentiles and what they chase after things. Are, and when you read the previous verse, it says, your heavenly father knows that you need these things. But as for you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added to you. And Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, uh, Without faith it is impossible to please and be satisfactory to him. For whoever would come near to God must believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him. You see, another key there, that God is a rewarder of those who honestly and diligently seek him. Praise Jesus. So we see from these two verses that when we seek first the kingdom of God, the things that the world is chasing, they will be added to us. When we diligently seek God, then he will reward us. And let me tell you the truth, when God starts to reward you, God rewards you, one reward from him can cancel out 30 years of toil. You know, one reward from God can cancel out 30 years of toiling. So, we need to, as we embrace the kingdom economy that we've been talking about this week, we need to look at practical ways that we can say we are seeking first the kingdom of God. The first thing you can do practically is to say, I want to give you my first hours. I want to seek first the kingdom before I seek anything else. It's one of the reasons that we started this upper room, you know. This upper room is there so that believers can have that space where they can seek God first in the morning before they go about any other business. This is the only church. It's one of the few churches that has a service at 5 a.m. in the morning, you know. We are in that space, 5 a.m., and we have chosen that before we pursue things at work, before we pursue the business, before we work. I know there's a daughter of mine called Melon. I like the way she talked about it. We were in a fellowship somewhere and she told me that I just like the way CNI programs things. You know, at 5 a.m. you can't say that you're giving a lecture. You can't say that you're opening the shop. You can't say that you're where you have to have time to be in the presence of God. It's only your bed that will limit. So I want to give us a challenge. Uh, this coming financial year, can you decide and say, I want to give God that hour from 5 to 6 a.m. I want to start off my day with God. I want to kick off the blanket as a sign that I'm seeking first the kingdom. I'm choosing to seek first the kingdom. And then you seek God every morning. You come and join us. And, and we pray together every morning. And we seek God. You know, before this upper room started, I realized I needed to, you know, have these moments of seeking God first. And, you know, you know you can say you're doing it. But if you don't have people that keep you accountable about it, then you can just, you know, hide there. So I got some friends and we started off by praying together. I think we started off, it was sometimes before, uh, I remember, I don't 
maybe it was June last year. You know, many things are usually bad things in June. So it could have been bad in June last year. I don't remember. So we started off praying together uh, with them. And we are praying every day from 6 a.m. to 7 together online. Then when schools were going to be open, uh, when schools were going to be open, uh, we decided to have 5 to 6 a.m. because 6 to 7 would be a time of, you know, uh, preparing kids for school and everything. And we started off like that. And here we are, Church Without Walls. What started as something between a few people, now you can see we are so many people. But I want you to, to, I want to challenge you to put God first, to put the kingdom first uh, in your prayer life, to put the kingdom first in your Bible study. There's something that I try to practice. I'm not perfect at it. And uh, I try to tell the, my students in the Bible school about no Bible, no breakfast, NBNB, okay? You tell yourself, if I haven't read my Bible, I'm not going to have breakfast. And I've been trying to do also NBNS, but it is difficult. No Bible, no social media. You tell yourself, if I, it's like you're giving yourself a responsibility that if I have not read my Bible, I'm not going to social media. If I've not read my Bible, I'm not going to have breakfast. And uh, you try it out. Do, do, come up with some, 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 something, you know. Come and be with us every morning in the upper room. And, uh, you know, 5 to 6 a.m. and we sit, go together. Then when you are here, you are accountable to us. We are accountable to you. We know that you are praying. You know that we are praying. We just don't assume that you must be praying. You know, I always want to tell my leaders and ministers, you know, I want to see you praying so that we don't assume that you are praying out there when you're not. You know? So I want to see you in the room. I want to see you praying. You know, seek first the kingdom of God. Make it practical. And then uh, after one year, we shall come back and evaluate and say, we chose in this financial year to seek first the kingdom of God. And compared to the previous year, these are the results. You'll be amazed at the results you'll see. He says, when you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, then all these other things, they shall be added to you. Are we together? Are we together so far? You know. Are we, are we there? Are we, are, are we together? Are you understanding this thing? How many are with me so far? How many are with me so far? Huh? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Why don't we trust God that, you know, the way God does things reverse. The world chases things. He says, chase me. And the things the world is chasing will chase you. Okay? The world is chasing A, B, C, D. I know that you need A, B, C, D also. But chase me. Okay? Chase after me. And when you chase after me, the A, B, C, D that the world is chasing will chase after you. So we want to come back after one year and we are giving the state of the upper room address. Hallelujah state of the upper room members and people will testify I chose to do this this is what God has done I chose to do this this is what God has done I embrace this principle this is what God has done you know the other practical way that you can seek God or seek first the kingdom is with your finances you know Jesus spoke and said, where your treasure is, there your heart shall be. Okay. If you want to know where your heart is, just see where you're putting your treasure. Okay. If you want to know that your heart is in something, just put your treasure there. Because where your treasure is, there your heart shall be. It's a, 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 a principle that Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 6. Now, 
almost all of us here, I think all of us here, we have at least two treasures. Two treasures. There are so many other treasures. But all of us here have at least two treasures that we share in common. Number one treasure is time. Number two treasure is money. Yes. Where you put your time reveals where your heart is. You know, there are people who meet me and they say, we see what you're doing. You're doing great things. Yada, yada. Because what time is the upper room? Oh, the seminar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they never attend. Their heart is not here. They just speak with their blips, you know. Yeah, we know what you're doing. That is great. I would like to attend, blah, blah, blah. But they never attend because their heart is not here. If their heart was here, they would give their one hour and be here in the seminar. Yes. You want, if you want to know where your heart is, check how you spend your time. Yeah. Check how you spend your time. Uh-huh. Now, the other treasure is this treasure called money. Now, God put a mechanism for us to try to get this treasure called money into the kingdom. Because if our money is in the kingdom, then our heart shall be in the kingdom. Are you with me? If your money is in the kingdom, then your heart shall be in the kingdom. And so, we see this wonderful principle, these two elephants. One of the elephants is called tithe and another elephant is called fast fruits. Now, we see tithing as one of those things that God has put there as like to test our stewardship, to test whether we can trust that the one who has provided for us can sustain us with 90% of what he has provided for us, you know. Tithing, the Bible says in Malachi 3.10, I know you know the scripture. It says, bring all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now by it, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and uh, pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room to receive. Now, you know, many there are so many. The, the, the issue of the tithe is that it depends on, on who you listen to. You can listen to somebody speak so passionately against it and you almost believe them. And you can listen to somebody speak so passionately for it and you believe them. So uh, I choose to be somewhere in between there. In between there. And I will give you what the word of, you know, People say ah, tithing. There are some people who say, ah, you know, tithing. It's a thing of, uh, it's a thing of the law. It's a thing of the law. So as when I tithe, I am trying to. I don't want to be under the law. Okay, okay. Let's say it's a thing of the law. So don't be under the law. Just give fifteen percent. Okay. Don't be under the law. Just give twenty percent. Just give thirty percent. Just give everything. So that you will not be under the law. Hallelujah. You know, you know, they say it's under the law. And they have a point. Because this scripture that you're seeing here, it is written in the context of the law. This scripture that you see there. And uh, he talks about how those who don't give the tithe shall be cast and what. But you know, we know from the scripture in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 that Christ became the curse of the law by being hung on the tree, so that those who believe in him would not be cast, okay? Now, the curse which is put on those who don't take the tithe, that curse, Christ became a curse for you. So, this is given in the context of the law. But we see that tithing existed before the law came into place. In Genesis chapter 14, Sacred put for us, Genesis chapter 14. I will request you, I am seeing my, uh, the, the, the points I have here and the, the time that I have here. 
I am seeing that uh, I might be caught by this time. So I want to request you, Ali, if you can give me an extra 10 or 15 minutes at least to exhaust this point of the tithe. Is this okay? Is this okay? Would you give me an extra 10 minutes so that we, we I, I share with you some of the things I, I have, have learned? My daughter Kara has given me 15, 15, <laughs> 15 minutes. Eh? You know, I, I have to, because we tell you it is 8 to 9, tell you it's 8 to 9, so we have to be good stewards of the time. That is one of our things as CNI. We, 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 we try to be good stewards. We try to keep our word to the people that we minister to and things like that. So if we go beyond the time, we request for permission. Uh -huh. Now, Genesis, thank you. Thank you for giving me time. Thank you, sirs and madams. Genesis chapter, chapter 14, I want, you to, I want to show you something. I want, to, I want you to see that the principle of tithe, the, the thing about tithe, it started way, it, it, it's a kingdom thing that the law adopted. That's the way I can say it. It's a kingdom principle that was incorporated in the law. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14 to 20. This is what it says. Abraham had gone to fight his nephew had been captured, so Abraham had gone to fight to recover his nephew and their goods and things like that. Genesis, let me get it. I think she's struggling to get it. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Verse 14 says, When Abraham heard that his nephew had been captured, he armed when Abraham heard that his nephew had been captured, he armed the three 18 trained servants born in his own house and pursued the enemy as far as Dan. Genesis 14, 15. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and attacked and routed them and pursued them as far as Hoba, which is north of Damascus. Uh -huh. Verse 16. Uh, verse 16. And he brought back all the goods and also brought back his kinsman Lot and his possessions, the women also and the people. Verse 17. After his uh, Abraham's return from the defeat and slaying of Chedolaoma and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, later called Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine for their nourishment. He was the priest of the Most High God. Note that. He was a priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, He blessed him and said, Blessed, favored with blessings, made blissful and joyful, be Abram by God Most High, possessor and maker of heaven and earth. You notice? He is blessed. The priest came and blessed him. Okay? And verse 20. And blessed, praise and be glorified God most high, who has given your foes into your hand. And, and, Abraham gave him a tenth of all he had taken. Now, you see that there is no law here. That is telling Abraham, give a tent. Nobody has told him when you go to a war and whatever, give a tent. It is just a principle. It is just a Abraham decides and he it's a kingdom principle. He decides that of all that I have received, I am going to give the priest of the Most High God a tent. And also notice that Abraham gives a tent after he has been blessed. <laughs> I always tell you what I teach, what I believe. For us in CNI, we always say we don't give to like coax God into blessing us. We give because we acknowledge that we are blessed. We give from the position of being blessed. We give because we know God has blessed us. 
with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and uh, giving is a key that unlocks those blessings. But in the spiritual realm, the blessings have been given. Just notice, the priest of the Most High God had proclaimed a blessing, had proclaimed a blessing upon Abraham. So we see here that tithing existed at giving a tenth is existent before the law is given. Now, personally me, I don't tithe as a fulfillment of the law. I don't tithe as, you know, if I don't tithe, I will not go to heaven. If I don't tithe, I will, God will love me less, whatever. I tithe as a kingdom principle of giving. I tithe as a kingdom principle. A kingdom principle of giving which unleashes, which opens doors. Uh, I've been teaching the Bible school students and I'm telling you now, there are streams, different streams of receiving from God. You know, in the new covenant, we receive by giving. We receive through giving. Give and it shall be given to you. Full measure, pressed down, shaken together, shall men pour into your bosom. So we give, and now tithe is one of those streams for me. Tithe is one of those principles of giving for me. Now, it is a kingdom principle that got incorporated into the law. Genesis, uh, Hebrews chapter 7. Let me show you a scripture here. Hebrews chapter 7. Where is Hebrews? Chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 is making reference to this portion of scripture in Genesis 14. And the writer of Hebrews says, talking about this Melchizedek, whom Abraham gave the tithe. You know, this should answer. when If tithing is a kingdom principle, many of you ask, where do I give the tithe? Where do I give the tithe? We see that scripture in Malachi 3.10 talking about the tithe being taken into the storehouse. We see the scripture here in Genesis 14.19 talking about the tithe being given to a priest. Yes, a priest of the Most High God. So those who ask me, I tell them, take it to the, you can take it to the storehouse, you can take it to your priest, you can take it to your man of God, you can take it to your spiritual father, whichever way you are led. In the new covenant, we are giving under grace. We are giving as we have made up our mind. We are giving not under compulsion or not under threat. I know that when I talk like this, I step on some toys, I disagree with some people, and uh, it's okay. But for me, this is how I understand it. And I try to get the scriptures to speak for themselves. Now, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he returned from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. You see, he blessed him. This whole business of people saying, uh, if you don't give me a tithe, I will not bless you. If you don't give me a tithe, I will not speak a blessing over you. If you don't give, bring a tithe here, you will miss the blessing of this house. Blah, 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 all those kind of things. We see here the priest is blessing the man before he gives him the tithe. Are you there? Are you there? And Abraham gave to him a tenth portion of all the spoil. Um, he is primary as his name when translated indicates king of righteousness. Then he's also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Now, let me ask you a question. Who is the king of righteousness and who is the king of peace? You can answer the question. Who is the king of righteousness and who is the king of peace? And when you answer the question, you will answer who should the tithe be taken to? Even when you're giving the tithe to your man of God, even when you're giving the tithe to the ministry, even when you're giving the tithe to, to CNI, to the church, wherever, in your heart you should have a revelation that I am giving this tithe to Jesus. 
Yes. He's the one whom Isaiah prophesied and says, unto us a son is, a child is given, a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of what? Hey. Hero of peace. Without record of father or mother or ancestral line, neither with beginning of days, no ending, but resembling the son of God. You hear that? Resembling the son of God. He continues to be a priest without interruption and without a successor. Now, do you have your answer? Do you have your answer? You know, I believe that tonight many questions are being answered, you know, so that you understand, be, be at liberty, you know, be at liberty. Don't feel under compulsion. Don't feel like you, like somebody is putting a gun on your head. You must give a tithe. You must, let me tell you, if you give the tithe, if you, actually, <laughs> Andrew Womack makes it even, you know, Andrew Womack is, I keep mentioning him because uh, he taught me and uh, he still teaches me but for a season he really taught me and he he was my teacher and one of the <laughs> he was teaching and it was for him it takes it because he giving is grace it's giving under grace so he says that if you have never if you have been tithing not been tithing and you want to start don't struggle you can even start with two percent Start with 2% and be consistent and go to 3% and go to 4% and 5%. And, you know, the whole idea is that you, 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 you are learning consistency. It's a kingdom principle that you are learning. But it is wiser to, get, to go with what the Bible talks about, 10%. 10% is a basic. We see Abraham gave 10%. We see Malachi 3.10 is talking about 10%. Okay, 10%. Now, verse 5. The law incorporates the tithing principle. Verse 5 says, It is true that those descendants of Levi who are charged with the priestly office are commanded in the law to take tithes from the people, which means from their brethren, though these have descended from Abraham. Okay, so the issue of tithing to the Levites and whatever, it is commanded in the law, in the law. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? It is there. It is there staring at me. It is there staring at you in the scriptures. It is commanded in the law to take tithes from the people. Okay, uh, verse 6. But this person... Who has not their Levitical ancestry received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who possessed the promises of God? Yet it is beyond all contradiction that it is the lesser person who is blessed by the greater one. Furthermore, here in the Levitical priesthood, tithes are received by men who are subject to death. In the Levitical priesthood, tithes are received by men who are subject to death. While they are in there, in the case of Melchizedek, they are received by one of whom it is testified that he lives perpetually. Are we together? Are, we, are, you, are you getting where we are going? A person might even say that Levi, the father of the priestly tribe himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. You know, that is Levi, the one who received the tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. So the priest received tithes and he paid tithes. That's why when people bring their tithes, for example, we, we, we also incorporate this aspect. And when people bring their tithes to CNI, when people, you know, uh, partnership and what, after a certain period, we get a tenth of what they have brought and also give it. So as a ministry, we also tithe. We receive the tithes, but we also tithe, you know. But all of this is done as we decide to, to tithe. You know, I, we could be there and choose not to tithe and whatever, but we are employing a spiritual a kingdom principle. We are doing it as a kingdom principle. Kingdom principle. Kingdom principle. Now, 
When Jesus talks about the tithe, he talks about it as having an aspect of the law in it. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. I just hope that, uh, I just hope that if, if, if I am confusing you more than you have been even understanding, just put up your hand and say, now I'm being confused. I'm being confused. But if things are clear, you can also say, it is clear. Or it is getting clearer. It is getting clearer. So that, uh, so that you know, we know uh, how to go slowly or or whatever. Now, <laughs> in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And he tells them, Wow to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders and hypocrites. For you give a tenth. Those guys were specialists at tithing. For you give a tenth of your mint and dill and cumin. Uh, my understanding is that these are vegetables. So they would tithe on the dodo, they would tithe on the greens, they would tithe on the sugar, they would tithe on that. Uh, you give a tithe on, they would tithe on, you know, on the sorghum, they would tithe on all these, they would tithe on these things. And it says you give a tithe of all these things and have neglected and omitted the weightier, more important matters of the law. Okay? Right and just justice and mercy and fidelity. These you ought particularly to have done, you see, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Without neglecting the others. So Jesus tells them, you know, you ought to do this without neglecting the others. So he's telling them, yeah, you give tithe and what, but they are weightier matters. Hello? There are weightier matters than the tithe. Justice, rightness, mercy, faithfulness. Jesus says those are weightier matters. You ought to do this without neglecting the other. Okay. Now, if you choose to uh, tithe in accordance with the law and you're fulfilling the law, then you remember that scripture which says those who live choose to live by the law need to do the whole of it. You need to do the whole of it. Like those brothers and friends who like to keep a certain day. You know, if you just choose to keep a certain day as fulfilling the law, then you need to keep the whole of Leviticus and the whole of Deuteronomy and the whole of um, Exodus. The whole of it. Okay? But there is a better way that you can give the tithe the way Abraham gave the tithe as a kingdom principle. He gave the tithe as a blessed man. I like that. The king of Salem, Melchizedek, blessed him, spoke a blessing over him. And when he spoke a blessing over him, Abraham gave him a tenth. So I'm, I'm welcoming you to the place of giving a tithe as a blessed man, of giving a tithe as a blessed woman, of giving a tithe as a sign of honoring God, of giving a tithe as a sign of saying, God, you have blessed me so much, I'm giving you a tenth of what you have given me. You know, this guy went to fight. He went with 318 servants in his house, went against the kings. The Bible says when he was coming from defeating the kings, he defeated kings with 318 men and he got a lot of plunder, a lot of plunder. And after, you know, Melchizedek meets him, whom we have seen really is Jesus, he blesses him. And after Jesus blesses him, Abraham says, ah, you have blessed me, oh, you have blessed me, oh God, you have blessed me so much. I'm giving you a tenth of what you have given me. Yes, giving you a tenth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love this. Do you love this? Do you get this? I love this. You know, I welcome you to this world, to this world of, of tithing as a blessed man, of enjoying to tithe, of, uh, of, enjoy, of, of tithing as, you know, saying, Lord, I am honoring you. This month has been so great. You have blessed me. I still have my job. Oh, I thank you that I have got my salary this month. I am blessing you. I am honoring you with this 10%. Have it, Lord. Have it, Lord. And you, so, you ask yourself, so who do you give it to? Ah, 
you, you, God has his priests. You will have a revelation in your heart who the priest of God is in your life. You'll have a revelation in your life who it is that you feed from. You'll have a revelation in your life because God will not be present in person. You not be present in person the way the, the 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 prince, this king of peace, was present in person for Abraham to give a tithe. But God is now present in His servant. He's present in the people He has put over your life. So get that place, that ministry that blesses you, that you feed from that man of God who is the priest. You can take the money to the storehouse. You can take the money to the man of God. We see Abraham gave the. The tie to the to Jesus, he gave a tie to a man. We see the tie they being command be given to the Levite, so you can give the tie to a person, you can give the tie to a house of God. Don't overcomplicate it, don't overthink about it. Just give the principle is to give. The principle is to give. I have been tithing since 1999. Eh? I told you in the morning how I even tithed on my wedding my wedding uh, uh, gifts, what, what people gave me for to do my wedding, I tithed on it because for me at that time, that was my only income. I didn't have a job. Uh, I did not have, uh, my wife did not have a job. So our income was, uh, was the, was the what? Was the, 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 the wedding pr- people, which the money which people gave us. But I had started earlier in 1999 when I was in S. Five, and I was the treasurer of the scripture union and I realized that I was a treasurer of a scripture union that didn't have money okay we, I was a treasurer just in name but we didn't have money in the stores and then I realized I needed to give my tithe into this scripture union so whenever they would give me pocket money I was in S5 whenever they would give me my mother my late mother would give me pocket money I would get a tenth of it and put it there in scripture union. <laughs> and then I went to university and I was the papa of the Christian union and whatever. And then I saw the needs in the Christian union. And, you, you know, I was a member of Deliverance Church, but I saw we were doing work in Christian union. We were blessing the university. We were like the church at the university. So we were the storehouse of the university. So I gave my tithe in the Christian Union. And, uh, you know, here I am many years later. And God has been good to me. God has been good to me. I tithe as a blessed man. I want to welcome you to the place of tithing. You know, tithing. You know, we need to come to the point where, you know, you call me excited. Can you imagine? I'm about to send you my tithe. Can you imagine? God has been good to me. Right, right, right. I'm about to send it. I'm about to send it. Glory to God. We need to come to that point where, where people just bring their tithe rejoicing in the house of God. God has been good to us. God has been faithful, you know. Tithe like Abraham. Abraham tithed as a blessed man. Abraham tithed as a defeater of kings. He did not tithe to defeat kings. He tithed because he had defeated kings. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> I know I am kind of distorting some things you have been told. Tithe that the open windows of heaven shall be open. Tithe that the, you know your plumbing system shall not break down at home. Tithe. No, no, God is not a mafia. God is not a mafia who tells you, I'm going to destroy your house if you don't give a tithe. I'm going to do it. But if you give something, I'll protect it. No, God is not like that. He has blessed us. The Bible says he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing uh, in the heavenly places. So start tithing, child of God, as a blessed woman. Start tithing as a blessed woman. That is the tithing we teach in CNI. Uh, that is the, when we tell people, bring your tithes, bring your tithe as a, as a blessed man, as a blessed woman. And, uh, you know, you are blessed. What you are doing is just activating that which is there hovering over you, the blessing which is hovering over you, the blessing which has been spoken over you, that blessing, it just now, the tithe activates it to be manifested in the physical. Hallelujah. Am I communicating something? I hope that I hope that I've helped somebody to understand this whole thing of tithe, of, of, of tithe, you know. You know, enjoy it, love it, love it. I've done it for years. I've done it for years and uh, you know, 
and uh, you know the, the, you know the, then we reached the point we were arguing about should we tithe about the about the about the uh, the net or about the gross then when we were in those arguments we didn't really understand that we were blessed people you know but when you are a blessed person you're like oh my god my gross income has increased i'm going to tithe i'm going to give you a tenth of this and i am ah Lord, you have been so good to me. Look at this business. You know, my wife taught me, my, when my wife had a business, she went to a senior businessman in Bara called Pastor Hillary. And he's a senior businessman who is also a pastor. He now pastor as a church called Nikakova, Gates of uh, something, Gates of Heaven. And uh, he taught her how to uh, give the tithe of your business. And I'm going to teach it for those of you who are in business. He taught her that, you know, when you get your stock and, uh, you know, you have bought this stock at this amount, you calculate what is your anticipated uh, profit, okay? What is your anticipated profit? If you sell it at this amount and you have bought it at this amount, then your anticipated profit, for example, is going to be uh, 2 million, okay, of this stock. It's going to be 2 million. So for you, you go in your business and you make your money and you make your money. When you hit 200,000, then you know you have hit the uh, the tithe of the anticipated profit. So you get the 200,000 and bring it to God as a blessed businessman and send it to Sandra, the CNI admin and wherever, or whichever ministry God has put in your heart and send it to the man of God, send it to your priest, your spiritual father, and say, God has blessed me. God has been good to me. You know, I had, uh, I brought this thing at this time. I am expecting a profit of two million. I thank God I've, through my sales this week, I've already got a tenth of my expected income, which is profit. So this is my tithe. After you give your tithe, then you start making the rest of the money and eating the rest of the money. And there's a way God multiplies that money. There's a way God blesses that money. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yes. I'm excited. I believe that this has helped someone finally to understand this whole thing called tithe, to demystify this whole thing called tithe. Tithe as a, a possessor of the promises of God. You read those scriptures, you know, Melchizedek said Abraham was a possessor of the promises of God. He was a, a defeater. He, 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 was a, he had slain kings. He had defeated kings. So this is a defeater of kings tithing. This is a possessor of the promises of God tithing. This is a blessed man tithing. Come to tithe as a blessed woman. Say, ah, God has promoted me. And I'm even anticipating another promotion. So I'm giving him a tenth of this salary. I'm giving him a tenth of this. I'm, I'm actually, this month, I'm just so happy. There are times when I'm so happy and just let me add 100,000 on it. You know, but I've not yet grown to add like 200,000. But I want to start saying, God, this time, this month, let me add you another 100,000. You have been so good to me. Let me add you another 300,000. You need to come that point where you enjoy giving. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a joyous giver. God loves that giver who is prompt to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me stop here. You gave me uh, 15 minutes. I have exceeded them by five. So 20 minutes extra. They are enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 23. 23. I, I, I've been doing this thing for 23 years. Yeah. 23 years. Oh my God. I hadn't realized. You know, these things make us look old. Yeah. I've been tithing for 23 years. 23 years in tithing. Sometimes as sometimes I was not understanding things, but now I tithe as a blessed man. I tithe as a blessed man. There's a time I got a blessing of 40 million and I just I went and joked at church. I said, uh, this tithe that I want to bring, I need security. I need security to carry because I'd never given a tithe of four million in other shillings. I told them I need security to bring this money. You know, you have to enjoy this thing. Enjoy, enjoy God, you people. We don't have we don't have too many lives to live. So enjoy, enjoy God, enjoy God, enjoy giving. Let, let me pray for you. 
Now you can give your tithes. Now you can give your offerings with joy. Give as a blessed man. Give as a blessed woman. You know, tomorrow, if you have been eating the tithes and what, tomorrow get your tithes and give them. Get your offerings and give them. In the morning, I'll give, I'll talk about another wonderful thing called fast fruit. Hallelujah. Uh, fast fruit. I want you to tell somebody to be a part of this. Tell somebody to come and listen. God is revealing to us mystery. Father, I thank you for these blessed people. I thank you for these possessors of the promises of God. I thank you for these possessors of the kingdom of God. As they give their tithes, as they give their offerings this night, Father, I thank you that they are blessed. I thank you that the work of their hand is blessed. I thank you that they are blessed in the city. They are blessed in the country. As they activate these blessings with their tithes and their offerings, I pray, my God, that this financial year, it shall be a year of unlimited blessings, a year of unlimited favor, a year of unlimited breakthroughs in their lives in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you and we glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.